بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته وأهل بيته أجمعين أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن زحزها عن النار وادخل الجنة فقد فاز وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله تعالى لأهل الجنة إن لكم أن تحيوا فلن تموتوا أبدا إلى آخر الحديث أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقو قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم فعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وعلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين My respected brothers, elders and sisters It's been more than three weeks since the events that unfolded uh, in the Middle East that we also we all know about, we are following and we see daily uh, more and more deaths, more and more children being pulled from the rubble. And we ask ourselves that, what do we do? First of all, what do we do? Number two, how do we process these things? And how do we react to these things? Because the natural first reaction is to be angry, to feel sad, to feel sorrow, then or even a sense of depression. But how does it impact my life? We've done all we can. We've increased in worship, in dua. Maybe we've given charity. We've become a bit active, whatever. But now, how do I internally process it? And the important thing is, at these times, is that we understand that when we see a dead body, where be it a child, be it a mother, be it somebody, no matter how they died, parts of their body might be somewhere and even burnt because of the illegal weapons that are being used or whatever. But we have to understand that them people have now afdaw ila ma qaddam. They have gone to a better place. And this is very important that our outlook on death changes and everything will change. The, the scholars used to say جسرون, that death is just a bridge which takes a beloved to his or her beloved reunites you and links you back to Allah Taala. and the death of a martyr this is the first class ticket nothing in between no accounting no accountability no stops on the way and you go straight to Allah Taala. all your sins are forgiven so that's the first thing we have to understand is yes we do feel sad you know you hear you get a message somebody's 15 family members all finished. They show a picture of somebody and she was getting ready for her wedding day and getting prepared and there were people around her and the next day that her and that whole family is no more. And you think how can we process this? What are we supposed to understand from this? But first thing we have to understand is all of them are straight into Jannah. And the best thing that's going to help us is that we now ponder over Jannah. What is Jannah? What does Allah Taala promise for us and for them in Jannah? The more we think about this, their trials and our trials and our journey in this world become easy. Why are we supposed to think about Jannah so, so many times and keep pondering over Jannah? Is because any journey, no matter how difficult it is, gets easy when we think about the destination. If you're going to meet your loved ones and it's a two-day flight, you know, some of the people when they travel home, they mention to me that we have to stop here, we have to stop here, you know, we're going to get questioned here, we know all of this. And then the flight itself is uncomfortable, we're paying a lot, but the fact that we're going to home to meet our families after a year or whatever, that's what makes it all easy. In fact, it becomes sweet. Even the journey itself becomes sweet because we're just thinking about, okay, I'll meet my children maybe I didn't see in a year, my parents I haven't seen in a while or whatever. So any journey, no matter how difficult, becomes easier when we think about the sweetness of the destination. So this whole journey of life is only going to become easy for us and for whoever we see suffering when we think about where they are going and where we are going. That's why I was just going to focus today on Jannah. And just to remind ourselves about paradise, what Allah has promised for the believers, the good people, and those martyrs uh, in Palestine. And then even not the, if you don't say the martyrs who are obviously getting Jannah, those who are left behind as well, and are being patient over the, the close ones who passed away. First of all, Jannah itself, paradise, mentioned in the Quran over 120 times, just the word Jannah, were mentioned in different, in, as Firdaus and etc. in more than many other times. <coughs> Allah has promised it for those who believe. Allah mentions He's promised it for the believers. Allah mentions He's promised it for the God-fearing people and many other things. Allah in one place in the Quran says, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ Giving us the ultimate 
result of this world and the hereafter. فَمَنْ زُحْزِ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَاسِ What is success? Allah spells it out for us. Allah says, whoever has been put far away from the fire of hell and into paradise or is put close to paradise, that person is successful. Whether in this world you achieved whatever you achieved, you got global power even, um, you were rich, you had luxuries of this world, but in the hereafter, if you end up being close to hellfire, you have failed. And in this world, if you had nothing, but in the hereafter, you had paradise, you have everything. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentions that a person um, who lived this, wo this world, such an easy life, etc., he'll be dipped for one second into, into hell and he'll feel like he had no enjoyments. And then the other way, a person will be dipped into paradise who had such a hard life and just one dip into paradise or will look at paradise and you feel like he had no worries because you forget everything straight away. So it's important that we keep reminding ourselves about Jahannam as well, about the hereafter as well, to scare us away, to ward us away from doing sin, to disobey Allah. But even as more of in, uh, a motivation, encouragement that we keep pondering over paradise, over Jannah. So Allah Taala in the Quran, he describes Jannah in many, many different forms. In just terms of names, Allah has about eight, nine, ten names for Jannah. Allah calls it Jannatul Ma'wa, which is the abode. Allah calls it Firdaus. Firdaus sounds a bit like paradise, especially if you say uh, P. There's no, uh, there's no P in the Arabic language. So it was taken from a previous uh, language, even before Arabic. But it's, it's got the same meaning as paradise. And it, it, it means something close by walls, meaning Jannah is going to have large walls around it. That's what they, they used to say previously, even before Islam. Um, that's what, just one name. Then there's Jannatul Ma'wa, there's uh, Darus Salam, Allah calls Jannah Darus Salam, the place of peace. Why? Because in Jannah, first of all, when you enter Jannah, the angels at the door will be saying Salam. When you get into Jannah, each person will tell each other Salam. And lastly, when you get to on Friday and Allah Taala personally comes and greets each uh, Jannati, each person in Jannah, Allah Himself will say Salam. And the Quran mentions all of these. Salam on Qawla min Rabbil Rahim, Salam on Alaykum Tibtum Bima Sabartum, etc. So this is why it's called Darus Salam, a place of abode of peace. Jannah has many levels. The scholars mention this. Some say this is the amount of the verses of Quran because the Hafiz will recite the entire Quran and get to the top level of Jannah. So some say it's according to that and just some say it's more broader than that or it's more general than that, whatever. Or it could be to the, the amount of deeds and it could just be unlimited, the amount of levels in Jannah. We know the highest is Jannah al-Firdaus and that's where the Prophets are going to be, etc. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you ask Allah, Ask Allah, when you ask Allah for Jannah, ask Him for Firdaus. And what happens in there? We can speak about that if you get time. So now what exactly are we going to get in Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has mentioned many things. Allah has mentioned many things. Just to summarize very quickly and just for us to understand slightly. Allah wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that those from the time of death, obviously the angels are going to come. Now on the day of judgment, they are first of all those people who will be put straight into Jannah, no accountability. Rasulullah in one hadith mentions is 70,000. And Rukasha radiallahu anh stood up and said, make dua that I am from them. And Rasulullah said, you are from them. Another person stood up and said, make dua I am from them. And Rasulullah said, sabakaka Rukasha. Rukasha has got there first. But the scholars mentioned it's not just 70,000. In other hadith, Rasulullah mentioned more. One in every 70,000, etc. So we know that we can be from them. That's why we should also make dua that oh Allah, allow me to enter Jannah without accountability. And there's many ways we can. One is obviously dying a martyr, which I mentioned about all these people. More than 10,000 or however many have passed away. They're going to go to Jannah without accountability. Without any reckoning, you know, you're not even going to be stopped. You know, you see two lines of people going in the airports, especially when you go through US and you have a beard or whatever. And you'll see some people who are just flying through, white people generally, and they're just going through. And then the people from minority backgrounds and the people with a lot more luggage and people with uh, scary names, they, they keep getting stopped. And the Quran even mentions this. <laughs> and then Allah says, <laughs> That some people are going, they're going, but then <laughs> stop the others. So even when you get stopped by security and you have luggage and you know you've got nothing, straight away you get some kind of fear. So that's when a person who even knows they've spent a good life, but when Allah starts to look into inside your books, suddenly you get a natural fear. That's why Rasulullah said, Whoever even just gets stopped and says, no, no, we need to check your books. The angels say, we need to check your books. Then understand that your punishment has started because you'll see other people going straight to the Jannah and you're going to be questioned now. What did you do at this time? Why did you do it? So, there will be some people who will be going straight into Jannah. When the people enter Jannah, obviously the Prophet ﷺ will have the key and he'll be the first to open it. 
meaning he won't be owning Jannah, but he'll, have the, he'll be the first to have access. Uh, and then the Muslims will enter Jannah. Allah says, وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ رَبَّهُمْ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ زُمَرًا The people of Jannah will be guided towards Jannah in groups. And then Allah says, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا وَفُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا They'll get there and the doors will be opened up for them out of respect, out of honor for them. When a, a, a luminary, a, a dignitary, you know, somebody of high standing comes, then you're waiting at the doorway. And then when they come, you open the door for them. This is exactly how Allah is describing it for the people of Jannah. Imagine, and it's not humans opening the door for you, it's Ridwan. The keeper of Jannah, the keeper of the keys of Jannah, or the, the doorman, the, uh, the gatekeeper of Jannah, he's opening the door for you and blessing you and entering you into Jannah. You'll enter Jannah and what you're going to see, you know, the hadith Rasulullah says, first of all, you see your palace and you'll stop and look. For how many years, 40 years, whatever. But that just means a very long time. And now we have to understand when we get into the descriptions that you might start to think of this world. I'd say something is made out of gold, something out of silver, fruits are going to be like this. But one rule we have to understand is, Ibn Abbas anhu said that um, nothing in this world, uh, nothing in Jannah will resemble this world except the name. Nothing in Jannah will resemble this world except the name. Meaning if Allah says you will get fruit, so automatically our mind goes to the best kind of fruit, which for me is mango. And for everyone else will have their favorite fruit. But it's not going to be when we, even if we say, oh Allah, give me a mango in Jannah, it's still not going to be the, the one that we get here. Um, for example, Allah says you'll have a palace made out of gold bricks and silver bricks. Now in your mind, you think go on Minecraft and make something out of gold and silver bricks. But still, it's not going to be that. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah just described according to the best thing that we know. The best thing that at that time as well and now is, or the most valuable thing is gold, is silver, pearls, rubies, saffron. And Rasulullah used all of this to describe Jannah. So it doesn't mean it's going to definitely be that. Yes, it doesn't mean all of this doesn't have a literal meaning as well. It doesn't mean it's just all um, examples Rasulullah is giving and Jannah will not be like this at all. No, it's some similarity, but we have to understand this is just for us to understand. And anyway, this is only for the bottom levels of Jannah. When you get to the higher levels, words stop to uh, can't even describe what we're going to get. Rasulullah said in Firdaus, you will get ma la what no eye has ever seen, wala udunun samiyat, no ear has heard, wala khatra ala qalbi bashar, and no mind or no heart has ever been able to comprehend. So this is now for those. So at the bottom levels, Rasulullah is actually using words to describe it, even though it's not going to be the same as this world. At the higher levels, you can't even use words. Imagine what Allah Taala is going to give us. We think about the best thing in this world, and it amazes us. You go to certain places, you know, wonders of the world or whatever, natural beauties, artificial beauties, and this ultimately was created by Allah in this world. Imagine when Allah wants to just give us something for our pleasure. How much Allah Taala can give? So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions that you'll gain palaces and they'll be however big they'll be. First of all, the, the lowest Jannah will be 10 times the size of this world. That's the lowest Jannah. The low, last person to enter paradise, he'll be burnt to a crisp in the fire of Jahannam. And he'll come out, he'll be dipped in water and now he'll be pure and he'll enter Jannah and he'll get a Jannah 10 times the size of this world. Can you imagine? And um, one tree in that Jannah if a horse, and again Rasulullah was talking to the Bedouins and the Sahaba in front of him, you couldn't say a car. But if you can obviously take the example, Rasulullah said 100 years journey of the fastest horse. So 100 years journey, there's nothing on this earth that you can, where you travel for 100 years and you basically won't be able to reach. Meaning the entire earth at the very least will be covered. Rasulullah is saying that just one tree and just one Subhanallah will get to that tree. So you'll enter Jannah, then the bricks will be made out of gold, they'll be made out of silver, the cement will be made out of pearls, rubies. Rasulullah said the sand of Jannah will be made out of saffron. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the, the smell of Jannah will be musk. Again, all of these are not definite, but we understand this is the best of everything. The best of smells is musk. The best of um, uh, valuable material, you could say is gold, silver. The best of spices is saffron. It has amazing uh, taste as well as look. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is describing all of these. There'll be no day and night in Jannah. Why? Because night is there for you to recharge, to get your energy back. But you'll never use your energy in Jannah. So why do you need the night? So Rasulullah said, there'll be no night in Jannah. They'll just be, um, most of the scholars say, it's like that time after sunrise, where the sun is there, but it's not really hot. So it's much more, it's the most pleasant time. You hear the birds chirping, you'll see the, the greenery, etc. This is how Jannah will always be. And why? Because the light of Jannah is not from the sun and moon. There's no sun and moon in Jannah. It's from under the arch of Allah, ta'ala, under the throne of Allah. Ta'ala. And the scholars say, even the Quran, it says, فِيهَا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَّةً You'll get your food in the morning and the evening. 
There's no morning and the evening. But it's just according to your habit of this world because you're used to that. Allah won't even change your habits for you because that's what you're used to. Imagine how much Allah wants to take care of our comforts in the hereafter. This was just some examples of Jannah, just, just a small kind of peak we wanted to get into Jannah. There's, there's too much that can be said regarding uh, paradise, regarding Jannah. There's now this doors of Jannah, eight doors to Jannah. Rasulullah mentioned that there's eight doors to Jannah, and this mentioned many hadith and Jahannam, the fire of Allah, seven doors. Because Allah Taala's mercy will outlast his anger. So Jannah obviously is more accessible, even though less people will enter Jannah compared to people in the fire of hell. But Allah Taala's mercy is more accessible. And in a hadith, Rasulullah mentioned there will be a door for fasting, a door for charity, a door for jihad, and a door for salah. And then the other four are not mentioned in the hadith. But we know these are four. And then there will be another four for maybe knowledge and other things, or akhlaq or whatever. But we know definitely these four doors. And then Rasulullah said, whoever does the most of one action will be called from this. And then he carried on giving the examples. And Abu Bakr asked, there will be any person who gets called from all the doors. Rasulullah said yes, and I hope you will be that person. And that's all a different uh, conversation. Um, the summary of what we get in Jannah, be without going to specifics, is that Allah says in Quran, That's one verse, and Allah Rasulullah said, You will get whatever you want. You will get. This is the summary. Some people get very technical about Jannah. Once uh, one companion, he gave, made a dua, Allah, give me a white house in the right hand side of Jannah. And he was going to get even more uh, specific. Rasulullah said, don't, don't get so specific or keep it general. Just ask Allah for Firdaus and you'll get everything else. Don't ask for one companion. Said to Rasulullah, I really like horses. I really enjoy horses. I like their company. Just open the curtain, please, inshallah. Let's just move in. Fill in the gaps. Um, fill in the gaps, inshallah. Jazakallah. Um, one companion said to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "I really like horses." So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Will I get a horse in Jannah?" Because there's no narration that we will get definitely have animals. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said that if you like horses, as soon as you enter Jannah, you will get a horse because it's whatever you want. So you will get a horse as soon as you enter Jannah. And then he said, "Whatever kind of horse you want, if you want it to fly, it will." Another companion stood up and said, "Oh Rasulullah, will I get something?" And he was going to go into something he liked. Rasulullah just stopped it there because everyone was going to stand up and say what they want. He said, you will just get whatever you want. There is no prohibitions in Jannah. So this is very important that we concentrate, we remind ourselves about Jannah for those. There is much more to be said regarding Jannah for those. In terms of the qualities of one another, Allah Taala in the Quran, He says, uh, One of the reasons is called Daru Salam is because Allah will take out hatred from your heart for one another. There will be no hatred, animosity, talking about one another. Just pure love between the Muslims in there and the angels, the people serving you and from Allah wa ta'ala. Imagine, every single Friday you will go to a marketplace. The hadith says every Jum'ah, which some scholars say every week or it could be Friday, it even means the time of Jum'ah because there's no Salah. There's no prayer in Jannah, this is the time for Salah. There is Dhikr, there's Tasbih, there's praising Allah but there's no actual prayer because um, that, that, that's for this world. And Rasulullah said every Friday you'll go. And then when you go to this marketplace, all the people of Jannah will meet, Allah will greet you. And you come back home, you will say to your spouse that you are even more beautiful than before. And she will say to you, you are even more beautiful than before. And this will happen every Friday, meaning until eternity. Meaning you will constantly be getting more beautiful for one another. And everything will be increasing in quality because there is no limit to the treasures of Allah. Ta so this is what, I mean, for us to even comprehend this in our mind, it's impossible. Like what can we, like even if I was to tell you right now to think of a color. That's never be, uh, just make up a color. Uh, you can't even do that much. Why? Because making up a color for us will just be to mix a couple of colors together and this might be some new shade. So we're mixing something that's already there. Whereas Allah Taala is going to give us things in Jannah for which there is no uh, blueprint. Another thing we'll get in Jannah is we'll get to meet our loved ones who have, we've left behind or who have left us behind in this world. This is one of the biggest bounties of Jannah. You know, you lose someone when you're young, your parents, your grandparents, your uncle, your auntie, even a spouse. And then you go 20 years in this world without seeing them. How does a person comprehend this? How do we process this? Um, request everyone to inshallah contribute to the masjid inshallah. May Allah reward all of you. Um, how do we comprehend this? The easiest and best coping, coping mechanism is to know that Allah is going to allow us to meet on the day of judgment. That's why they say the most happy time in Jannah will be the first day. The first day, why? Because first of all, you know Allah is pleased with you. And number two, you will meet them long lost relatives and friends. You will meet your parents who may have passed away before you and for years you haven't seen them. You will meet your children. Some people, the children pass away young and you'll see them in Jannah. And then you know you are now of eternity together. 
So imagine the, 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 the happiness we'll feel on that day. Another amazing thing in Jannah, another amazing thing in Jannah is that we will be able to meet the prophets, the companions, and the pious people who have passed. Imagine going to Jannah and you get to meet Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Imagine going to get to Jannah and you can sit with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and speak to him. One of the scholars was asked, tell me one sentence or even one word which will make me feel like going to Jannah. Sometimes we think uh, all of this and then do I even want to go paradise and then we just need to get encouraged again, motivated again. The scholar replied, Fiha Rasulullah. In Jannah is Rasulullah, what do you want? You can sit with him, you can talk to him, just look at him. Isn't that all we want? Is there anything that we want more than this? So you just get to see Rasulullah so you can ask him, how was it when you went for Mi'raj? You can ask him, how was it when you received your first revelation? You know all these stories that we hear about, about Musa and Islam, ask him, how was it when you were running away from Firaun or when you hit that person and he died? Or you can ask him any of these different stories. You can ask the companions, um, Khalid bin Walid and Umar radiallahu anhu. You can just sit with them and just listen to their stories. The stories we've been reading about, we've never actually seen. They made cartoons about them probably. But then we can actually ask them, how was it when you were there? Abdullah bin Masood, how was it for you to kill Abu Jahl? And you know, these kind of things. Imagine that's, that's what we we'll have in Jannah and Allah Taala describes this scene. Allah says, Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. The pious people in Jannah will be in na'im. This is actually another name for Jannah, which just means all kinds of good, fortune, uh, happiness. Ala al-araiki yandurun. They'll be sitting on couches which are made out of silk, etc. Again, silk is just the best thing that we can think a couch can be adorned with. Ala al-araiki yandurun. They'll be sitting looking. And Allah doesn't even mention what they'll be looking at. Allah, there's no mafrul, what we can say. What are they looking at? The scholars say they are just looking at the bounties in, because they say one is the bounty you have and one is now to just sit back, relax and look at the bounties. You buy a car, you're using it, the car is nice. But then to just get out and just look at your car, that's a pleasure in itself. You buy a nice house, you're living in there, it's okay. To just step out and just look at your house, that's a, another enjoyment. Or to have your kids playing in a garden which you just set up or a park you just made. And then you just sit and you look at it, that's a special enjoyment and pleasure in itself. So they'll be sitting there, the children will be there, their wives, their friends, the slave, uh, the servants in Jannah, etc. They'll be just looking at this, the gardens, the rivers, etc. And they'll just enjoy. So in al araiki yandurun, then Allah says, Ta'rifu fi wujuhim nadratan na'im. You'll see this, this light on their face. And in another verse, Allah says that they'll be sitting face to face. And they'll just be speaking. And this is what the scholars say, that you know, you'll just be talking about this world, you can talk to the pious people you never met. You can talk to the great personalities. And you'll just sit and you'll talk. And this will be one of the most beautiful sights and most peaceful sights in Jannah. So these are this was just a small description I wanted to give about Jannah. Very important for us too. And then there's, there's about the food as well. That nobody will ever get fat. Nobody will ever need to go to the bathroom. And all of these things. There's many things that we can talk about in Jannah. The other thing is Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam came from Jannah. Whether it was actual that Jannah, a portion of Jannah or Jannah on this world, whatever. But it's the fact that our forefather came from there shows that Allah is allowing us to understand that our forefather came from there, we, that is our boat. We'll be going back there. It's a way of motivating us every day that that is our case to go back there. So I just want to mention regarding these things because we have to understand it is important for us to focus on the hereafter and, uh, at this time. Why? Because when we see all this injustice happening and this oppression happening, if we don't have belief on the day of judgment, in the day of judgment, uh, regarding the fire of hell and regarding paradise, we will feel very despondent and disheartened when we see any kind of oppression. Even if a woman is in a troubling relationship and the husband is not giving a divorce, for 50 years she has to go through this torment. Even if he ended up going to court and they give him whatever he has to pay, whatever, she will never feel kind of justice is done. If a person was to kill 100 people and he gets the death penalty, he's only going to die once. But when we believe in the, in the day of judgment and we believe in the fire of Jahannam, the fire of hell, and we believe in paradise, then we have hope and we understand that true justice can only be given on that day. True justice can never be given on this day. Bashar who's killed more than a million Muslims in Syria, if he was to be taken to task now, they'll give him a death sentence or they'll give him a death penalty. So that's one life for a million. But we know when he meets Allah Taala, then he'll be given an eternity. And that, for that, every single person who's been harmed, who's been hurt, will understand and will feel solace. That no, no, on the day of judgment, we have a judge who's going to rule honestly. And that's why Imam Shafi rahmatullahi he said, for the oppressors and the people who do good, there's one verse which is the most powerful and that is, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّةً Your Lord doesn't forget. Any small good you do, He's going to know. And any bad you do to anyone, He's going to know, He's going to take it to task. That's why it's very important for us to focus on the hereafter. And keep telling ourselves that don't worry, whatever's happening, whoever's bombing who, which children are getting murdered, displaced, Allah is going to take everyone for task at that time.
that's one thing. The second thing we have to understand that Jannah is already created, it's already there. And that's very important because it means from now we can start preparing our Jannah. Uh, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa met Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam on Mi'raj in the night journey and he asked him, uh, he said, give salam to my ummah. And that's why when we hear this hadith, we should say, actually, wa alaykum salam to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he said that, tell them the Jannah is there, but it's barren land. So every single person in Jannah is barren. وَأَنَّهَا قِيَانٌ وَأَنَّ ذِرَاءَهَا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَمْدِ اللَّهُ وَلَا إِلَهِنَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ That if you want to uh, beautify your Jannah, adorn your Jannah, then say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, وَلَا إِلَهِنَ اللَّهُ وَاللَهُ أَكْبَرُ And there's many hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whenever you fast, Allah Tabarak Wa Ta'ala Himself builds your Jannah. Your house of Jannah gets built. So imagine, you know, when, when a millionaire or something wants to build a house, they go and look for the best architect and the world famous one. Imagine Allah Himself coming to build your house, coming to design your house. That's, that's why from now we should try, start to build our Jannah. And we can do this from now, from today, leaving Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wala ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Any kind of good action we do and understand that our Jannah is being built from now, Allah Taala gives ability to act on what has been said. Wa alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa 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 alayhi wa sallam,